So, you know, you have different levels of organization, right? I mean, you've got like an accountant, which is pretty high, and then you've got like serial killers, you know, that are very organized, and then you have J-PAL uh, at the sort of the top <laughs> of the spectrum. And so, you know, on the, on the list of things they wanted us to talk about, it's, it's very laid out for us, right? So there was a set of objectives, and I thought, these people were organized, I should stick to the objectives. So those are the objectives that we were given to stick to, <laughs> and I'm going to... You're supposed to make this look more... Very natural, that's right, yeah. I actually have on the notes, act natural. Uh, <laughs> so, um, first thing we're supposed to do is talk about how rigorous evidence influences policy. Um, so I thought, well, let's just ask the computer, how does uh, rigorous evidence influence policy? <laughs> 15 minutes, right? <laughs> um, so unfortunately, it kind of doesn't often, right? Like that, that usually when policy is developed, it is developed almost every other way than through evidence. Um, and I can say this as a recovering appropriator, um, you know, that, you know, I've had a bunch of different jobs in government, many of them involved giving away money. Um, and so, you know, when I think about what that process looks like, I mean, you've got, so you've got this smoke-filled room, you know, um, you've got scoring alerts, right? So, you know, people in Congress, people in the state legislature think they're going to go do one thing and then they find out that some C4 put out a scoring alert on that bill and now they have to be on the other side of that issue. Um, the picture of the soccer, like, so, like, my kids both played soccer and especially depending on what age your kids are when they play soccer, at the three to four to five year old thing, there's a ball and all the kids, regardless of what color their shirt is, are swarming around the ball. Um, and like sometimes evidence, you know, sometimes policy development looks like that, where everybody just kind of goes on the internet, especially when you've got like a new administration and it's all 20 something year old interns who are running your policy shop and the governor says, hey, I want you to go build me an initiative that does X. And they all kind of look at each other and then they go to the internet and try to figure out what's everybody else doing that looks like it's good, and then we'll try to make an initiative that looks like that. And then you've got sort of like the press and the feel good and the advocates who run around saying like, just do something for the children. We barely even care what it is, just do something, right? So, so you know, policy development, unfortunately, often is motivated by those kinds of factors more than by actual evidence. So um, in my very natural transition to point number two from the objectives list, um, the next thing was the, the challenges that policymakers face and then the strategies that are available to try to overcome that. So, you know, again, going back to the budget process, you know, at the end of the day, everything's about money. Um, and even, you know, though each year you theoretically have, depending on whether you're in city or state or, you know, national government, you've got, you know, millions or billions or trillions of dollars available. But the overwhelming majority of that money will go to where exactly it, it went last year, right? And so, um, you know, if you think about, you know, sort of an average state government. An average state government will have something like a $25 billion budget between own source and, and federal resources. Um, you know, and so natural growth on that $25 billion will be a few hundred million dollars a year. You'll look at last year's budget and say, okay, well, if we want to keep that same stuff, we need to put up this much more money to maintain that stuff. And then you've got this tiny little increment. And then all the fighting within the appropriations process is about that little increment. You know, and so you know, the overall size of the budget is pretty misleading because it creates the sense that there's all this freedom and all this latitude to do things. But really, you, know, you fight around these tiny little margins um, as the process goes along. So you know, as I think about you know, obstacles to evidence-based policy, um, they're having a great time over there. Um, uh, <laughs> what's that meeting about again? <laughs> I don't know what my options are. The, um, you know, I mean, one is, depending on what policy area you're looking at, you know, the evidence base just may not be that good, right? I mean, there's lots of different things where, you know, maybe there's just not, you know, preset initiatives to pick up and go do something with. Um, you know, especially the last decade or so, there have been lots of issues where even if the evidence is there, things have become so intensely politicized that people are not prepared anymore to negotiate or form policies based on actual information. Um, everything is based on, you know, gut feeling or conjecture or, you know, whatever kind of form of hyperbole you might have. Um, you know, another thing that sort of makes these projects tough to put together, and certainly we experienced this in, in the one that you know, all of us were involved in, is that, you know, it, it took us three years to build this Nurse Family Partnership project. Um, you, you know, and it's a project that is great and is very important and is going to mean big things for, for these first-time moms and their kids, but it's also a huge project that took three years that serves less than a tenth of a percent of the membership of the program and will tie up less than one-tenth of a percent of our expenditures over that period, right? I mean, so you think, okay, well, if I needed to do a thousand of those, 
in order to spend all of my money with an evidence-based kind of mindset, that, that's just not feasible, right? I mean, so, um, you know, that can be, you know, a burden and a challenge along the way as well. You know, reputational risk for providers and advocates. I mean, so, you know, it, there's a little bit of a, you know, catching the dog catching the bumper kind of thing. You know, that often providers will say, you know, I want to scale up, I want more money, I want to do more stuff, I want to serve more people. And then we say, okay, great, I got more money for you, but I also want to do an RCT. And then everybody in the universe is going to see what the results are, regardless of how it plays out. Uh, and then they kind of go, well, what, can we just see the results and then we can decide whether it gets published anywhere or not? It's like, nope, nope, it's all going to be in the public domain. All of our contracts are subject to FOIA. Everything's going to be in broad daylight. Um, you know, and there's a lot of risk to that. I mean, so if, if the results come out the way they hope, it means that now they can go out there and, you know, make sure everybody in the universe goes and sees the findings. If it doesn't go well, you know, it could be a huge impact on, on their fundraising, you know, and especially if they're, a, you know, sort of a philanthropically organized organization. Um, lack of capacity to sort through research. I mean, so this was a big one for us. I mean, at the end of the day, basically nobody in government is really geared to be able to sort through the body of evidence and available initiatives on their own, right? I mean, so you've got to go someplace to find that kind of help. You know, for us, I mean, it was the, you know, Government Performance Lab at the Kennedy School. Um, you know, and it was, you know, working with a series of foundations and other funders to help get access to those kinds of skills and expertise. Um, decision makers, unfamiliarity, discomfort, I mean, I, mean I, I have talked about RCTs in front of appropriations committees and everybody's eye is just glossed over. Now, of course, that's exactly why I did that, because I knew there'd be no follow-up questions. But, um, you know, but, but, but it, it's not a glamorous thing, right? I mean, so going out to, you know, people who write budgets, Especially on the legislative side, this isn't necessarily the kind of thing that's, that's going to say, yes, I want to give you a bunch of money uh, to go off and do rigorous evaluation of social programs. Um, you know, and that gets to the last point. It is kind of a meta thing, right? I mean, like, it's, you know, there's this, um, you know, sort of cabal of us who move around and, and talk to each other and talk to you about how important evidence-based policy is. Um, but clearly there's more people in that room um, <laughs> focused on other things, you know, and I think... You know, I, one of the big questions that I imagine we'll probably spend some time talking about is, is how do you get these people uh, and everybody else to start thinking this way too, right? You know, and applying this kind of mindset and approach to whatever it is we do in the, in the public space. Um, so overcoming the challenges, I almost spend too, too much time on some of this stuff, but, you know, ways to get at the challenges. Um, you know, one of the, the reasons that I, you know, early on wanted to get into some of these paper success kinds of arrangements was to be able to... That's the, is it my voice or is it the microphone? <coughs> I guess the microphone. Um, was to stick my successors with my ideas, right? Because, you know, especially when you've been in government and you see the turnover and you see the burnout and then, you know, every new administration comes in, decides that everybody who was there before them is dumb, throws out all their initiatives and creates brand new ones. Um, you know, th this, this can be a way to really formally enshrine a long-term initiative in a way that your successors can't unwind it. Um, and for me, that was personally satisfying um, for a variety of reasons. <laughs> Most of them are related to public policy. Some are probably more Freudian. Um, the little things at the bottom are, um, there's a guy named Andy Allison who was Medicaid director in a couple states, and he went off and did this study a year or so ago to look at the um, you know, tenure and, and you know, compensation structure and other things for Medicaid directors. And, and what he came back with was that you know, right now the, the median tenure for Medicaid directors is in the neighborhood of 18 months, you know, and, and, I, and I focus on Medicaid because, um, you know, for the same reason the Dillingers and Bonnie and Clyde and everybody used to go rob banks, right, because that's where the money is. Um, you know, if, if that's where the money is, then that's where I think you want to try to get some kind of toehold, um, you know, into, into the way those programs are run, you know, and so if, if a Medicaid director burns out on average every 18 months and it takes three years to build a pay for success project, how many projects can we, this is not like a, a math, like word problem question. You don't need to raise your hand and answer the question. But, but, but it's a small, it's a very round number, right? Like it is basically impossible to get projects then if that's what it takes to put these things together. So that's, that's another threat to, to these kinds of efforts. Um, you know, why would you do projects like this? You know, to, to get real actual evidence to be able to make decisions about how to spend money, right? Like that's, that seems to me at least pretty straightforward. Um, you know, the, Again, going back to the appropriations process, you know, everybody's got some story, right? You know, and, and the way that we decide how to spend that little marginal increment each year is based on somebody comes in with a story about, well, my neighbor's nephew 
got uh, hemophilia and this was really important, so we should put lots of money into this project, you know, or it's, um, you know, some other kind of personal anecdote or story, or there's some kind of statistic, you know, and as we all know, 31% of all government statistics are made up on the spot, um, you know, and so, I think it was 31. <laughs> anyway, yeah, you know, so like, you know, there's a lot of correlation, there's not a lot of causation, um, you know, and I think, you know, through these kinds of projects, you can get a better sense of, of what really, you know, the best investment would look like. Um, you know, again, I mean, going back to why to do these long-term projects, I mean, it's, it's a way not just to make sure that your policy priorities stay in place for a long time and are, and are, you know, durable and continue. It's also a way to hedge against whenever the next recession is, right? Because if, you know, state governments have the, you know, past balanced budgets, uh, unlike some other governments, um, you know, there's lots of risk that when the next recession comes, your project gets cut too, you know, and, and in order for the evaluation to really work, obviously you need to be able to insulate the project against that kind of risk. And so again, you know, if you can structure the contracts in the right way, you can get around that kind of risk. Um, so, you know, the key elements of research partnerships, again, you know, one is you need people to help you, you know, sort through the ideas, find the right kind of interventions, uh, be able to figure out, you know, where to go from here. Um, you know, again, there's some, there's some opportunity to get political risk away from the, the, you know, the state or the local agency and kind of hand it off to whoever's implementing this project for you. Um, going back to evaluation costs again, you know, so you know, it would be tough for me to go in front of an appropriations committee and say, hey, I want a couple million dollars to run an RCT at this project. But I can go to a foundation and say, hey, I figured out a way to pay for this project if you can figure out a way to pay for the evaluation. You know? And so you run around and sort of do that whole rock soup thing where you go and, and knock on five or six or seven different doors and then through all those different bits and pieces, you're able to find the intellectual capacity to identify project candidates for you. You can find somebody to do a lot of the uh, intermediary and implementation work. You can find somebody to do the evaluation for you. For, and then you can find somebody to help pay for all that kind of stuff that you have trouble on the government side figuring out how to justify the expenditures for. Um, our project, and I don't want to spend too, too much time on this because I think Kate's probably going to get into this in more detail, but, you know, long story short, once upon a time before I came out to run HHS, I was uh, the state budget chief and the governor's policy advisor. Um, we applied to the Kennedy School, which was had this sort of, you know, call for proposals or, you know, requests for assistance to put together these kinds of projects. We got selected. Spent a few years, much of it negotiating with the federal government over a Medicaid waiver, uh, but also working with Nurse Family Partnership, figuring out how to structure this project. Um, after a few years, we sort of got through that piece. Um, you know, why pick NFP? I know I'm on the clock, so just go back and read the slides on the internet later, um, or just, you know, again, just ignore my slides and just go to the internet and go straight to NFP's website. But, you know, there's lots of evidence that uh, this model works, and so it was a pretty easy place to go. Uh, as a thing to scale and try to get to more moms. They, they also were already in South Carolina. They've been operating through funding provided by Blue Cross Blue Shield Foundation, uh, by the Duke Endowment, and by other funders for several years, um, but only serving a couple hundred moms and newborns, and so the goal was to scale that to several thousand more. Uh, and then big picture, you know, it's a $30 million project over five years. It's five years because it's tied to a five-year Medicaid waiver. Uh, there's about $17 million of philanthropic money in the, in the project. There's $13 million of Medicaid payments. And then, uh, depending on how the evaluation goes, there can be up to $7.5 million of state-funded success payments on the back end. And as the bit on the bottom shows, um, you, you know, they've got to make real tangible progress in order to get those success payments, right? So the state, through the Medicaid program, with the federal government, pays a small per-visit fee uh, for nurses to go into the homes of soon-to-be mothers and then new mothers um, to provide you know, a variety of services. Uh, if, if, if that intervention is successful, then we should expect to see meaningful progress on the four criteria that are down there below. Uh, a lot of negotiation with NFP and other parties to get to those four particular indicators. We wound up with those four largely because one, um, they were connected to savings. You know, we needed to make the financial model work in order for the federal government to give us the Medicaid waiver. Um, and frankly, for, you know, a recovering budget guide to think that this was a good idea, right? I mean, we, we want good social outcomes, but it has to make financial sense at the same time. Uh, and that's a lot of criteria to try to piece together in one project. Um, but they have to hit those minimum performance standards in each of those four categories. I mean, so 26% reduction in child injuries is a pretty big deal. They gotta have to get the 26% before we start making those kinds of success payments. 
If you're into Medicaid stuff, you can come back and read this slide later about what exactly, which, which pieces of the Social Security Act got waived in order for the project to be able to make sense. But lots of participants, as you see at the bottom, involved in the overall project. There's a contract between the state, Nurse Family Partnership, and the Children's Trust, which is a sort of state-chartered nonprofit in South Carolina. Obviously, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services are important because they're the ones who had to give us the waiver in order for the project to get approved. Uh, JPAL central to being able to get the evaluation I mean, even conceived uh, and, then, and then put into place. Uh, Kate, who you'll hear from in a second, who does investigation stuff. That's what the eye is for, right? And then, um, and then social finance, also important. And, and really, social finance, very important to helping nurse family partnership understand its own financials. You know, I think one of the things we learned in this project was we just sort of assumed everybody knew what their own books looked like. And the first year of this project, in a lot of ways, was about helping NFP understand what its cost per unit really looked like. You know, a lot of foundations, they, they go off, they raise money, they spend the money. When they run out of money, they go and raise more money and, and don't necessarily know how to, you know, do cost allocation to connect that work to sort of specific per unit kind of costs. And it, it took quite some time to help get to a place where that all made sense. That was around 15 minutes, I think. So I think, ladies and gentlemen, Kate.